our second talk of the session, which is, um, well, I, I'm not going to guess what it's about anymore, I, I'm wrong every time. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Josef, um, the stage is yours. All right, then it's up to me to explain this. Uh, <laughs> the, the words, thanks. Um, so some of you might have seen uh, my presentation yesterday at live, um, what I'm trying to build with uh, TypeSell. Um, it's uh, kind of a mix between Notion and Jupyter uh, notebooks, and it's built on top of a local-first architecture. And I want to share my experience, yeah, really building on top of local-first. Um, TypeSell is a fresh, takes on, a fresh take on what I think documents and software could look like if we really think about, okay, putting users in control. Uh, for me, what does that mean? Uh, focus on hackability, so making it possible for users to extend the software from within the software and user programming, etc. And also try um, the very ambitious goal of making uh, the complexity of programming uh, a little bit less complex. And I try to do that with a live evaluate as you type uh, programming environment. Um, and of course, build on top of a local first architecture because of all the other end user benefits already I think everybody is uh, familiar with. And because why not, how hard could it be? Um, <laughs> uh, so here we go, today I'll, uh, I'll share uh, my experiments and uh, lessons learned. Um, I hope to give you some insight in yeah, how uh, I went about uh, building this, uh, so you don't have to uh, hit the same roadblocks. Um, but I also look forward to hearing from you, like, okay, why did you do this, uh, etc. And I'll do this mainly by going through the different, uh, the different layers uh, in the application. Um, before I show uh, how, the, how TypeSell works, um, good to keep a couple of design principles that I had when building it in mind. Um, so in TypeSell, everything is a resource, and the resource maps to a YJS uh, a document. Uh, things are editable as much as possible by the client. It's built on y YJS. Um, I do have a server, but I, like um, philosophically, I would love to minimize the logic on the server, so I would love to minimize that central uh, authority. Um, and the way it's architected is uh, it consists of many small, lazily loaded uh, resources, um, as opposed to having an application that syncs all the state to the local, uh, local storage um, and then build on top of that. Uh, types of consists of many small uh, resources. Um, because maybe at some point in the future, there's going to be this big graph of people working on different resources that are interconnected. Uh, as I would love to see that someday. Um, enough said, quick demo, uh, so you can grasp what it looks like. Um, first, okay, what is TypeSell? So this is more about the live programming environment, but then we know what it is. So it's similar to uh, Notion. Um, but uh, in Notion, you're limited to the blocks that Notion uh, provides, or in Google Docs. And in TypeSell, you can actually um, extend it with a notebook-style programming environment. So here I have one variable in one cell that's used in the other cell. Um, the 1990s marquee is still alive, and when I, send, when I change uh, the other one cell, <coughs> it gets propagated to the other cell. Um, and then when you take the system and you start building on top of that, you can uh, build other things, import libraries from NPM, uh, get some cool confetti, or um, maybe make small calculators, small programmable uh, documents. Um, you can also extend the system. So in this, uh, in this document, I register uh, a block uh, that is a map. And now the Notion kind of document system is extended with the concept of a map that TypeSell doesn't have any notion of. So now the user can press trash map, and a map is inserted into his document, and is imported from the, uh, from the other document. Um, so now you know how the, yeah, what it's about, um, but of course this talk is more about the local first uh, principle, so let's see uh, what that looks like. Um, as I mentioned, everything in TypeSell is a resource. So here I'm visiting my prof profile uh, with the uh, tester, it was just a demo account, um, and when I hit F9, I actually uh, bring up uh, this inspector, so this might be interesting to like, yeah, how I worked around one of the limitations that uh, Annette mentioned. Um, I hope it's visible, but you can see uh, the resource that has been loaded now in memory, and this is this has the type uh, profile. And there is resource. This is this corresponds to one YGS document, and everything has an uh, ID, which is like a random uh, identifier and a way to uh, address it. And here I can inspect a single document, and you can see, okay, it has my username, it has the, uh, the date that I joined, and also uh, the uh, URL of my avatar. 
Now, when I open my workspace, you see you suddenly see a lot of other uh, documents being loaded. And these are documents of different types. So now you see a project document and a number of uh, rich text uh, type documents. I can inspect that. So if I look at the workspace, which is a project document, you can see it has references to its children. Um, and they all have an ID. And when I open this project resource, it needs to load those children because I need to know the titles of those documents, right? Um, something else, another concept that I use is the URL uh, resolving. So every, every YGS document has this uh, unique identifier and there's one step. So for example, the page that I'm in now, it's tester slash public, uh, et cetera. And there's a way to resolve that where actually the server is involved, but it resolves to two identifiers and those are two nested documents. So this is actually the project resource uh, is now the parent and then it knows, okay, I need to load the sub identifier as well. This project resource, what you see in the left hand side, um, but it's got this view where it can load this nested resource and that's the, um, what I call the sub document. Um, let's see when, um, so here you see all the documents being loaded, which corresponds to the left. And now I'll collapse one of the folders and to be able to show the documents in that folder, um, this is what I meant with the lazy loading. Yeah, I need information about those documents, in this case, the title. So you'll see, okay, they, those are instantly loaded in. Uh, when I expand it, and this is all happening local first, right? So it's first loaded from disk, and then in the background, it starts synchronizing them uh, with the server. Um, but if I collapse it, you can see they're still available locally. So now I say, okay, also show the documents that are uh, not loaded into memory. Um, and you see the loaded property uh, for those documents that are not actively being used. They're set to false, but they're, yeah. So how you can see that things are uh, offline. Um, that then, of course, brings all the benefits uh, that we know from a local first uh, architecture. So here you see live collaboration between you two, uh, two different tabs. I can set one uh, user to have a flaky connection. So go from offline to online every five seconds. I can start editing the other documents and set to offline um, so that it will basically pause syncing. I can edit the title in one, one document, um, go offline, and then you'll see it reflected in the other document or the other way around. And I think what is nice uh, to notice, uh, because I'll talk about this later, is once I edit this title, you actually see it reflected in four places. So it's reflected as the title in the document, it's reflected in the sidebar, it's reflected in the title of the browser, and it's reflected in the URL. And this is because, um, yeah, I find it very nice uh, to see how, for me, it became a lot easier to build a reactive uh, view application on top of local first architecture. So this was actually, maybe in a traditional architecture, this is a lot harder, a lot more, at least requires more code to implement. Um, and here, everything just works, uh, quote. So now you see it's updated anywhere instantly. And also in the, in the URL, in the title, etc. cetera. Uh, finally, uh, now I open a private window and also has the concept of, okay, everything should be editable, so users can start editing this document. Um, it saves its changes in local storage, but of course I'm not signed in, so it cannot si uh, sync it to any account. Um, but it does give me the option to either revert the document or to sign up, save a copy, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but it's a cool way for people to already get started with the software without maybe creating an account. Um, There we go, sorry. Uh, yeah, so I hope that gave a, gave a good overview. And uh, now I'll go through the different layers and my experience in, uh, in those layers uh, with local first software. Yeah, my experience was a little bit different than uh, from Annette and Annette's students. Um, I figured because I, I really experienced, okay, because updates are streamed in automatically from the CRDT level and writes are instant because you have to do the data locally, it actually makes the view layer a lot easier than when you're uh, building a traditional application. Like no more um, 
error handling about network requests everywhere, data requests, uh, etc. And you don't need to write an API layer for every model that you add to your application. Um, a lot of that plumbing really goes away. Um, but yes, um, I do feel sorry for those students because getting started with YGS, uh, it definitely is complex. So um, this to write, yeah, you have this nested, and this is similar to that nested uh, to-do list that you were talking about. Um, it's complex, it's not very uh, ergonomic, as, as people say. And uh, reading is even worse, so you need to manually observe changes to the document, etc. I didn't want to work with that, so um, I built SingStore, which is an open source library which tries to solve uh, these things, and also gave me a lot of hand-on experience uh, that helped me building the rest. Uh, but the writes now are simple uh, property values uh, writes, and um, uh, it translates to what you see on the, on the left. And reads also automatically listen uh, for changes. And that bridges with reactive libraries such as Mobix, Vue, uh, Svelte. And now com my components are uh, React components that simply look like this. And they automatically update when the age of James, in this case, when it changes, that component will automatically re-render, but it will not update when anything else, uh, let's say you change James, James's last name, or let's say you change uh, James's uh, uh, height, or uh, whatsoever, uh, this component will not re-render, but any change uh, about age, whether it's local, remote, etc., um, automatically now gets propagated to the view, level of, to the view layer. Um, this took a look at uh, JavaScript proxies uh, stuff, et cetera, to, to, uh, uh, to build, but it did find, yeah, it made that view layer a lot more easy to work with. And you can actually um, see some to-do examples in about 200 lines of code uh, uh, now. Uh, zooming out, uh, this is kind of like what the entire architecture of the local first uh, system now looks like. Hope it's visible. Um, so as I mentioned on the left-hand side, you see the app UI and the, the, the view layer stays quite, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite easy, but we move a lot of that complexity. Uh, I think the backend is also relatively easy because it's regular updates, data agnostics updates that are being uh, shuffled around. Um, but there's more complexity in the sync layer, which is what you see below the document pool. Um, and that definitely, I think, at this moment, uh, when you're starting to adopt a library like YGS, um, uh, there's more uh, things going on there. Um, so I had to build a sync layer um, that takes care of this. So the view layer just adds, like, uh, asks the sync layer, okay, load the document with this ID or create a document with this ID, but then it's the sync layer responsibility to keep a pool of all the different documents uh, to connect the YGS providers or remotes, um, connect IndexedDB, connect the local storage, um, keeping track of the sync status. Uh, so one thing that I do is when you edit one document offline, um, and then maybe you later on you open type cell, but it's not necessarily that document, I still want that document's changes to be, uh, to be, to be synced to the server, right? As, long, as soon as your uh, connection reestablishes. So there's all this orchestration around documents, uh, the sync status, forking, reverting, uh, et cetera, which you saw, um, that at this moment still requires a lot of orchestration. So it's not, it's all not rocket science, but it's definitely, um, whereas the view layer was a lot less work, now there's more work here. And I do think there's, I know there are some people in the room working on uh, things to, uh, yeah, libraries, frameworks to make this uh, a lot easier and uh, excited to see that as well. Uh, that brings me to the back end. Um, and there I had some fun experiments um, where I thought, okay, because I had to yeah, work on a lot of uh, stuff on the view layer, the, like the, the notebook system, et cetera, in the first year of building types, I was like, yeah, I'm not going to build another auth system. I'm not going to um, uh, build the storage, uh, et cetera. You know what? Hey, these CRDTs, they just shuffle updates around, so maybe I can actually connect uh, an existing backend uh, to it. So I, I tried this experiment. Uh, where I connect uh, Matrix, which is an open source chat server, um, as the transport and the storage of my updates. Um, and this was fun, uh, and actually worked quite well, uh, so I didn't need to uh, write my own backend. Uh, and what I did is, um, instead of chat messages, I sent the CRDT updates, and instead of chat rooms, you now have, or the chat rooms, 
correspond to uh, documents and the chat messages they correspond to updates. Um, and then I got all the stuff that Matrix already provides out of the box, so identity, authorization, et cetera, potential also for end-to-end -end encryption. I think this will be interesting uh, yeah, to, to see if there can be a world where you, where you have like a bring your own backend uh, system, whether it's for compliance reasons, uh, reasons so companies approve certain type of backends or uh, user preference, uh, et cetera. One sec. Um, so this is what it looked like. So you have this collaborative docs, and then if you look into a chat room, normally this would be hidden, but it's just base64. This is the actual matrix chat app, and you see the messages uh, being sent there. Um, uh, I also built the same for uh, Nostr. I got some good response for that. Like, uh, yeah, go ahead. Quick question on that. Did you ever get um, flood banned? Like when you send too many messages at once? Um, I didn't get banned or whatsoever, and, uh, um, but I host my own uh, matrix, matrix instance, so that's cool. It's open source, it's decentralized, federated, so um, I could prevent myself from being banned. I wouldn't do this, uh, pollute the, their public you service. Ran on Slack. Uh, <laughs> 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 they didn't want to run our infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It was fun, but we, it's so you got banned? You. Okay. Yeah, well, nice. it, uh, it would like block the bots for mm -hmm. spamming the channels. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> I managed to avoid that, uh, for, uh, fortunately, but um, there are some reasons uh, that I tried okay, not to go too far in, into this direction. It was super interesting to explore. I also did it on top of Nostr, which is a decentralized uh, Twitter people are trying to build. Actually, uh, Jack Dorsey, one of the founders of Twitter, they, he saw it and he, uh, he sent out a message endorsing it, like, oh, this is an interesting direction, et cetera. So there's, this is, there is interest for this space, but for me, um, I was running out of innovation tokens, so to say. So I uh, decided, okay, um, um, pause this for a while with end-to-end -end encryption, that would be really nice. Um, but it's really complex to get the key management, the UX uh, right, et cetera. So I said, okay, let's uh, pause this and focus on um, some other of the other stuff. And now I'm settled uh, this summer, which is actually cool by itself. I managed to uh, keep the entire application intact and create plug in a different backend. Like, yes, of course, it was a couple of weeks of hard work, but uh, at least it's possible I didn't have to start the entire application from scratch. From scratch. Um, one of the main reasons was also because I wanted cascading permissions and Matrix didn't support that out of the box. So I wanted, uh, okay, if you, and I think uh, uh, you also demo this, if you have access to a parent folder, you want access to documents in between. Um, uh, and now I built that on, uh, on top of Superbase, which is Postgres, uh, basically uh, Hocus Pocus as a WebSocket backend. And the backend, I still try to keep it uh, to a minimum. Um, uh, so it's responsible for rejecting some invalid rights. So you shouldn't be able to change your joint add date that I showed earlier. Um, and it um, uh, also takes care of the permissions. Uh, I would love to see a decentralized way uh, of doing this. Um, for now, that's uh, handled as, uh, like on the database level, these permissions, and including the cascading permissions are handled, handled on, the, on the database level. Um, not sure if I have time to go too much in depth, uh, but where it gets more uh, complex is areas such as cross-document operations. Of course, you have search. Um, one that I was interested in is things like back references. So let's say a user links from one document to the other, um, uh, so Alice creates a document, favorite cities, as a link, link to Bob's document, Lisbon. Um, but Alice cannot, uh, doesn't have right access to Lisbon. But I would show, want to, would love to show on the Lisbon page that actually, oh, Alice is linking uh, to this. So how do you model this um, in a CRDT uh, world? Um, that's a challenge I've been exploring. I'm curious to hear your solutions to these uh, kind of problems. One thing that I'm experimenting with is so-called inbox resource, which is a public uh, append-only um, inbox where users can post messages like, hey, I actually did post a link uh, to this document, um, and then with some validation around this. Um, it would be interesting to discuss this more uh, in depth as well with you experts on this. <laughs> um, but I think it's time to conclude. Um, and uh, yeah, for my experience, Building local first, uh, yeah, of course it brings a lot of end user benefits that uh, have been discussed many times. Um, but what I really experienced, it also enables or maybe 
um, forces a clean separation, a truly clean separation of concerns, and that really levels up my engineering uh, productivity. So to summarize that, no more uh, crap plumbing, uh, finally uh, get, rid of, get rid of that stuff. Um, so you get a really simple view layer, uh, simple, even pluggable, uh, potentially pluggable data agnostic backend. Um, so I think that is super promising and fun also to build this way. Um, of course, there's also challenges as with any new technology. Uh, yeah, you have to invent a couple of things. You have to work your through, way through those. I do feel sorry for the master students having to work, work with this. Uh, <laughs> um, there's more complexity that moves to the sync engine, so to that middle layer. Um, I think there's a good opportunity for uh, frameworks to, uh, to, uh, to take some of that plumbing away. Um, and everything cross-document gets more complex than, I think, things that I didn't touch upon uh, but are well known as challenges, schema management, migrations, validation, um, etc. And also uh, some UX paradigms. So uh, in TypeSile, when you have everything is editable, that works nice for the main document, you can show a message like, okay, changes are unsaved, sign in or revert. But what if I drag around a document on the left-hand side? How do I present that to the user? Like, okay, you actually made a change that is not that is persistent for you locally um, um, because we like that you can edit this, but uh, you need to sign it. How do you reflect that? Yeah, I think um, working with colors could definitely be an interesting uh, way. But I think there's also a lot of patterns that still need to be invented or need to limit the users in the, some way. All right, uh, thank you. Um, Awesome presentation, Yusuf. Um, I'm curious how you handle lazy loading with cross document references. I think I remember you showing that at some point where you can like refer, you can export a something from one document and then uh, import it in another one. Or did I misremember that feature? Um, yeah, so it's based on the ID system. So the other documents, when you open that, it knows, okay, it needs to load the this ID. Um, and then this kind of crossovers between the local first and the programming, the live programming part, but then mm -hmm. the live programming engine gets the data from that document, puts it in the reactive engine, and now the context that that reactive engine creates is also available then to the code that renders the parent document. Does that make sense? Gotcha. So you basically like walk the document to see if there are any references to other documents when you lazy load that one and you lazy load all the documents that it refers it's, to, it's, more uh, or less? It's being lazily loaded when the view layer so it's not, in the sync engine, there's no resolving of references, but as soon as the view layer needs it, so it says sync layer dot load a document with the ID, uh, gotcha. then the sync layer basically handles the model, which is translated into an observable MobX gotcha. model to the view layer. Um, but because things are local, that is fast. So I don't think... That makes yeah. sense. Yeah, okay. I got it. So you always synchronize all data? Then in the background, when you have it in memory, it starts syncing uh, the, the things in the background, but the view layer doesn't have anything to do with that right. because that's so the sometimes, magic. Sometimes the data may not yet be present. Yeah, then it's the, the so there's a, actually, there's a load and a get operation. The load is, uh, returns a promise that uh, only resolves if you either have the document locally or um, if you're connected to the internet, and the get only returns <laughs> Uh, returns the document or undefined, uh, um, uh, so only if it's in the pool already or locally stored. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, at the end of the presentation, you mentioned like the some access control, like read or write access control to parts of a document, like with the Lisbon uh, example thing. Um, I'm actually very encouraged to hear that this is a problem that other people encounter because I have a paper at Uppsala, which will be presented on Friday, which is somehow a first proposal to manage access control for parts of documents, like for example a counter embedded uh, somewhere, where like a server can specify a security policy, which, is, which then the yeah. untrusted clients should uh, somehow yeah. Uh, follow. So 
please come watch the presentation if you're here on Friday, and also uh, come to my poster, uh, which I believe is today on the poster session. Nice. Yeah, yeah. It sounds super interesting. And then uh, because I think that also opens up the opportunity that you don't need the server to like uh, handle all this. So uh, fine server at the moment, but hopefully at some point. Um, hopefully at some point it will be um, peer to peer, but that revol uh, de devolves into key management, nice. as we have seen. Looking forward. <laughs> Maybe post a link on the Discord also. Then, yeah. uh. I was curious, just to make sure I understand you about how you do uh, synchronization. Um, does the document need to be physically loaded into memory and then you do the network sync? And so then you're applying any of those small network changes to the loaded document in memory and then you can write that to disk. Is that right? Um, yeah, so this is based on the, the, the YJS provider system, and yeah, it needs to be in memory um, yeah. to sync. Um, and then there's the concept of the background syncer, which sees, okay, have there any been, it's basically a table, which is also a YJS document, yeah. um, that keeps track on, uh, there's like a need save, needs sync since property, um, so that if there are local documents that haven't been synced, that the only thing the background syncer does is put them into memory, it says load, and when they have been synced, it uh, okay. releases the reference and then uh, it will be... Okay, yeah, that was, that was kind of what I was getting to, is if I have two documents and I'm currently working on one, and you're working on the other one, I don't get your edits until my system loads that second, second document in the background, even though I'm not looking at it. If you're not looking at it, and if there's no, it. yeah, but then you also don't need the, unless I'm missing something, do you need the, the updates then? If you're not. Well, I might, well, if I'm working on document A, and I know that you're working on document B, and I'm going to pick it up where you left off, and I go get on the plane, and I open up ah. my document, and yeah. want to look at your document, I don't have your changes, yeah. unless I physically synchronize it. It kind of goes back to the, to the triangle yeah. question, where some, something I've been thinking about a lot is what happens over the network I might want to send a bunch of stuff over the network to synchronize a lot of stuff, yep. but not do a lot of work on my CPU to actually physically yep. update the CRDT. And so then what goes over the network versus what's stored on disk versus what my application looks at might be different yep. in different places. But the way that you're doing it keeps it nice and simple because you physically have to yeah, have it in so memory. So you're right, I do it for the yeah. write part, I solve this problem, but not for the read part. So I'm not like, uh, yeah. it could be you've missed updates. Um, uh, yeah, that's currently not addressed. Yeah, but yeah. that, yeah, that makes sense for this yep. case. So that, yeah, interesting, thanks. Yep. I would just quickly like to take this discussion on the, the programmability level, right? So you wrote your own sync layer. You said that could be uh, put into, put into a, um, a library, a framework but your application also seems to rely a lot on the specific behavior of the sync layer. Do you think this is something that, that I, I would think, be good to extract? Yeah, I think there's definitely generalizable things like um, the a document pool. I think that um, AutoMerge is like, I saw the preview of the AutoMerge repo, which is taking care of parts of this uh, stuff. So it shows, okay, the generalizable thing is yet you have um, documents that need to be contact, connected to network or to storage uh, and with the identifiers. There were a lot of sim similarities between okay, the problems and how I solved them and I think what that is maybe, doing. Maybe to ask for the, the other side, are there things where you where would say being able Whether to customize not, this yeah. were like super useful? Um, so there are things where uh, permissions, I think, um, I, I can fork and revert documents. Yeah, maybe it could be part of the sync layer, maybe those are uh, generic uh, things, but um, maybe not every application wants to have the potential to edit the document when you're not signed in. So um, maybe the sync layer could provide it. I mean, there is no application specific code in that sync layer. Um, so it's possible to extract it, but the question is, is everybody interested in those? So maybe we need languages to build sync layers. Ah. <laughs> everybody wrote that one. <laughs> huh? It just takes five minutes. <laughs> uh, thanks. I'm so sorry you had to do all that work. Um, you, you should have had more time to do the fun parts, and um, the rest of us should have fixed those problems already for you. Um, that said, there are still problems. I'm curious, I haven't got to it yet, but it seems like you might have, or at least you're probably thinking about it, uh, background sync. 
Mm -hmm. um, have you looked at it? Is the browser standard support good enough? Does it work? Have you tried it? Huh. I have not. It's an easy, simple Okay, answer. yeah. Sorry. I, I, do, you, I, do you plan to? Uh, sounds interesting. So okay. that's just, uh <laughs> right, Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> has anybody else got background sync working? No? It, uh, Brooke has. Here. In, uh, background sync in a browser? Just I mean, yeah, this, unless you're running somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, what, what's the specific problem that you're running yeah. into? I don't have the tab open and someone has edited the document. So there, oh, I see. So there's like a browser API. You already know about some magic browser API where you can like spin up the app then that can do this, right? Or like the the, the unfortunate know. answer for us was a service worker, which is not always does not always work in all browsers, right? But uh, it's it's magic when it works. <laughs> yeah. How do you keep it alive? Just for the stream, I've, uh, my, my service worker goes to sleep whenever Chrome feels like it. Um, this is there's background sync, which is some API that the Chrome has that's non-standard. I'm not sure how widely distributed it is or if it works on mobile. You know, like really finessing this stuff and getting from like, it looks good in the demo when you have the person sitting there to uh, it works uh, every time when you get on the airplane that the data is there is like quite a lot of work and I just, I, it seems like other people are racing ahead so I was hoping maybe somebody had done this one already. Uh, and you even have to try mobile Safari. Yeah, mobile Safari is a special kind of hell and so is uh, uh, Android on, um, uh, Chrome on Android also has shocking absences at times. I think shared workers don't exist there. Service workers do, but not shared workers. Yo, yeah, Johannes, apparently, for nice. those who are not there, you can, will, Johannes Schickling. I was hoping this was the reason you've been uh, compiling and linking Chrome. Uh, that was an <laughs> earlier project. So uh, that, that project, and I'm only mentioning this as a cautionary tale because nobody should do this. Um, I was trying to fix um, the multicast DNS support because some intern set a flag wrong in like multicast DNS support like 15 years ago at Chrome. And it was like a one byte change and it took me two weeks and I never got them to accept my patch because the notional owners of the module hadn't actually worked on it for several years and no one would reply to my emails. As far as I know, my patch is still somewhere in the Chrome like bug <laughs> tracker. Um, so save your, save your energy nice. and I've, besides, I've, Peer to peer doesn't work anyway. I've been there. I spent two months working on Chrome for a different project this, earlier this year. So yes, that was <laughs> that was. Uh, if you want to learn more about that project, that one was called Capstone, and I think I wrote about yeah. about this on the Incan Switch right. website. Thank you. I guess we are out of time, so we are now for the last talk of the session.